brother! And welcome everyone to our spoiler review of Pixar's brand new movie, Turning Red. Yeah, this movie I feel like is coming what feels like slightly out of left field for me in terms of Pixar movies. Like I feel like my anticipation for most Pixar movies has been massive. So this yeah. one, it, it felt like it crept up on me a little bit. Like last week it was like, hey, it's this weekend. Yeah, it has um, been a very different approach to just like marketing the movie and like the way they're releasing it. And I, yeah, I'm excited to hear all of your thoughts on that. Yes, if you have not seen it yet, it is available uh, on Disney Plus and it is not premier access. If you have a subscription, you will have access to it. Yes. Otherwise, let's dive on. Hey, brother. Guys, exciting news. We have a brand new candle scent that is now available over at carlinbrotherscoffee.com. Cue the sizzle reel. Dude, this was, you're right. This was such a different way for like, I mean, it's not, it's not that different, right? Because Soul and Luca both came out exclusively on Disney Plus. Yes. However, the difference is those were both planned to be in theaters and sort of got like, mm, we need to redirect because of COVID into Disney Plus. Right. And this, I assume, was probably ideally going to be a theatrical release, but way, way, way ahead of time, like before they even started doing theater ticket sales, they were just like, nah, screw it, straight to Disney Plus, even though movies are back in theaters now. Yeah, so, so. Uh, across the board, it's been it's been really kind of like fascinating to watch as these two worlds are colliding, especially even just when you consider like where COVID landed in relationship to like Disney Plus and even just streaming services seeming to be like hitting full steam ahead. Yeah. Um, because we've saw what, what I'm going to refer to as the Encanto effect, where I feel like Encanto was released in theaters over Thanksgiving weekend. Right. And largely it, it seemed like it Went fell on unseen. deaf ears. Yeah, like yeah. people weren't going out to see it. It wasn't smashing box office numbers and really nobody was talking about it. I think the video we made in the wake of that was like, Will Mirabelle be a, a Disney, Disney princess? princess? And it was like one of our worst performing videos that we've had on the channel in like years. Until. <laughs> Until. <laughs> Until one month later, they release it over Christmas break. Everyone comes into the new year and all of a sudden Encanto is like taking over the freaking world. It is. It is everywhere. It is. Like, and rightfully so. It's so good. It is. It's absolutely yeah. amazing. Uh, and, and so... What's fascinating to me about that, and before we, I guess, dive really hard into the review here, is really to just assess and be aware of the state of cinema mm -hmm. as we know it, or whether or not we're going to con continue to see this change happen. Like, yeah. I know, uh, again, over like the holidays, they released the movie Red Notice with Dwayne Johnson and Ryan Reynolds onto Netflix. Yeah. And a lot of what they talked about with that movie was the like minutes watched. Yeah. It, it, like, so what you're dealing with now is like a new metric for air quotes, box office numbers. Right. And so what I'm fascinated about is whether or not we're gonna see more of that with future movies where we don't talk about opening weekend being like, it broke a hundred million dollars, like by Saturday night or whatever, it will right. be how many hundreds of millions of hours have already been consumed of this piece of media. Right. The other interesting bit about Turning Red not going to theaters is that I know that a lot of the people that worked on the project were not happy about it. Yeah. Like not getting to see their work be on like you know, big the, screen. the big screen. Yeah. Um, so as, as we watch all this transition, it's like, it's, I'm curious to know whether or not we're watching the future unfold before us and this is just like how things are going to be or if this is just gonna be this odd little spell phenomenon that existed just during. Yeah, it's it's been very weird because like movies are back in theaters and I can't like imagine a future where there's just not movie theaters. No, and I you know? I can't either. So it's- It's, it's like, yeah, but w will you see some sort of like 
hybrid situation where it's like, yes, it came out in theaters, but also we just put it right on Disney Plus That's what, on the same day. That's why I feel like Encanto is so relevant to the conversation with yeah. this particular movie is because they put it in theaters and I'm sure that it, I mean, costs so money to do that. Yeah. And you're trying to, you know, bring in all this, all this dollar revenue in order to recoup those costs as well as pay for the cost of production. So the, yeah, the real curiosity to me is whether or not they saw the effect of Encanto in all the peripherals. Like, did it get people yeah. to make, uh, to sign up for Disney Plus? Were people buying more merchandise for it? Was it just streaming? you know, bits yeah. of it from the internet, buying the songs. Like there's there's a variety right. of different ways that you can monetize right. any of these any things. Any of these things. And that's like, but also if you want to back up a little bit further, there was also Soul, which had no theatrical release. It also right. just came out over theaters and seemingly like we came into the new year in 2021 and it was just like Soul, like everyone was talking about Soul. Like it did really well. Right, so from, from my best perspective, not trying to determine whether or not what should be important to any individual, especially those who worked on the project, it seems like going direct to streaming is getting more eyes faster right. than the movie theater. Yes. But there is the asterisk, of course, there that, that is, we are still somewhat in this pandemic world. Right, um, so, so many weird balls in the air in that direction. And it's like, yeah, we'll, when will the next Pixar movie come out in theaters? Because Lightyear is only a Lightyear. few months away. Yeah, so I guess we'll have another test soon. It seems like they're deciding to test it specifically with Pixar. Right. Too, yeah. which is interesting. And it's like, like I know when I first heard the news about turning red going straight to Disney Plus, it seemed like there was very mixed reactions. Like in the one camp, it was like, just like, how could they do that to all the people working on the movie? This is you know not fair. This isn't, you know, they're slamming it right to home DVD, basically. Right. Home streaming. On the other hand, it sort of felt like, it, to me, like my initial reaction that I, and I, this could be totally, totally wrong, was that like, it, it felt more like a Pixar decision. Like, no, we want more people to be able to see it immediately. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. And I don't I don't know if that's true or not, but I think that's going to be the effect. And this is only, it's only been out for four days now. So we'll just have to sort of wait and see. Right. And and from a from a family's perspective that may have gone out to the to the movie theater to watch it, there is the argument to be said for the fact that a Disney Plus subscription is seven or eight dollars a month. Uh, and you 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 do have full access to the movie and can watch it as many times as you please. Right. Versus going and purchasing as many as, you know, four plus movie tickets plus right. concessions and right. Like I mean, yeah, that. I have a family of five and you know, it came out on Friday. We all sat down on Friday together, watched it at our house. It was right. very easy. If we had to stop to let, you know, go put people to bed or, you know, go for bathroom breaks, that was also easy. And since then, we've watched it like two more times. <laughs> I can tell you that if it was just in theaters, none of that would have happened. No one except probably me and maybe my wife would have seen it so far. Right, so, right. So from an exposure standpoint, it does seem like this direct to streaming is is very distinct from like direct to DVD, direct to VHS, which you would have seen in the past which was largely like, it, it meant that the only people who were gonna ultimately see those films were the ones who saw it at the at the store and purchased it right. with less hype, with less theatrical right. and stuff like that. So, so all that being said though, the other big kind of big picture conversation that I think applies to Turning Red as a movie is sort of where Pixar exists right now in the animation space. Because I think one thing that does confuse people is that Disney owns Pixar Animation Studio and Walt Disney Animation Studios. Right. And so Encanto was made by Walt Disney Animation Studios and um, Turning Red, Red was made by Pixar Animation Studios. So there, there's a kind of odd question of distinction. It's like, why does th the giant Disney Corp have these two different entities? And I, I am pulling on a small thread here and this is not news, this is just like me looking into it and thinking it's kind of an interesting shift, is one of the big things that Disney has struggled with historically as a company is hitting that tweens audience. Mm -hmm. So basically people aged 12, 13 through like 21 to 24, because you sort of have those people who have like maybe outgrown the fairy tales a little bit. And like from a park standpoint, for example, uh, we know that a lot of kids will migrate to Universal Studios right. versus going to uh, Walt Disney World. Right, uh, and, and they come back. And they do come back afterwards yeah. because, I mean, nostalgia kicks in and they maybe start having families of their own. You right. know, there's a lot of warm sentiment towards Disney. It's just this gap period that 
it seemed like Disney wasn't really able to capture for a period of time. Um, that being said, I think Marvel has done a lot to start <laughs> yeah. filling that void. Um, but I think with the animation studios in particular, it's interesting to me to see what we're getting from both of them. Because uh, looking at Pixar and, I'm not Pixar, but Turning Red and specifically also Soul, I know when Soul came out, there was a big conversation like, is this movie even for kids? Right. Like, like this, is some, ba- <laughs> this is a very existential. Things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like, and and probably my guess is that there is a, a story, a narrative, a through line that one is for the kids and one is for anybody with higher thinking ability that is taking it uh, beyond just a colorful and fun uh, film experience. Yeah. Turning Red, I do think while it has a lot of, um, you know, bright colors, it's beautifully animated, like younger characters, the characters themselves are in these adolescent years and the themes of the movie are- Yeah, adolescents. <laughs> they are adolescents, yeah. yeah. So it's like, it, this, was, this was, as I was watching it, I was like, I am extremely curious to know whether or not, and you have a four-year-old, yeah. so like what Luke's reaction to the movie was, because I could only see it through the lens on this side of the equation. Right. Um, and so I, I think that's interesting. It's like whether or not Pixar, uh, the voice of the animation studios is, of that animation studio is starting to grow with us. Mm-hmm. And what we're gonna start to see is Disney animation continue to be the like the classic, brightly colored, inspiring, um, you know, fun-loving films that we've we've known right. and loved our entire lives, and if Pixar might take the ball on bigger topics. Yeah, like it'd be things. interesting if that's like a like a top-down sort of decision, or is that is or is it more reflective of like art reflecting society or something? It's just like this is where Pixar is going because this is just where they're going. It's true. Yeah, yeah that's like, it's entirely. These possible. are just the stories they have right now. Right. Um, Because that seemed like so much what it was. The director, uh, Domi, she, like, this is her, I think, um, she directed Bao, the um, Pixar short before this. And then this was her first, like, big theatrical one. And it's obviously just very much about, you know, her life. You know, both of those stories are about um, Asian Canadian families and parents dealing with their kids growing up. Right, right, (laughs) right. It is very clearly representative of her own life living in, uh, growing up in Canada and, you know, drawing and stuff. Right. Yes. Yeah. So and anyway, dealing with her mom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, that being said, yeah, like, we can we can dive on into uh, the movie a little bit with essentially the plot. Yeah. Um, which is that you have Malin, and she is, I guess, 12, 13 years old. Just turned thirteen. Just yeah. turned thirteen. Ever since she turned thirteen, she's been doing her own thing. There you go. Twenty four seven, three six five. <laughs> so she's she's got like an enormous amount of spunk. She's definitely yes. one of these kids. Um, like that is oriented towards like achievement and success and like wants to succeed and be independent and, you know, is is attempting to think with adult thoughts as soon as she is able to. Right. Um, and I think some of that comes, you know, like thematically from like the way that her mom approaches her relationship with her, the way that she pushes her. But it does also seem to me that like Mei Lin is like, She's driven. Like this yeah. is, she wants to be achieving in these ways. But, but I think- Does she want to achieve for herself or is it for her mom? Right, which I think right. is a big question. Uh, but then the other end of that is you see that she still can't overcome the fact that she is, she is still- like, Right, she's still just a teenager. A budding teenager. Right. Like, she still wants to go and hang out with her friends. She's still obsessed with the boy bands. Like, you know, she's got her, um, what are the little Tamagotchi? Oh yeah, she's got the Tamagotchi. Yeah. Robert Jr. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's like you you have this this little girl who's who's really representing uh, like two very, very different like mental capacities, so to speak. One of them being incredibly like fun loving, just wanting to do the things that kids do. And the other one that like wants to mature and grow up and like have responsibilities and, right. and, and press forth in that way. And ultimately I think what we're watching with the film and and is that she reaches the stage where she now, if her emotions get out of check, turns into a giant red panda. Right. <laughs> My interpretation of what the giant red panda is, uh, is basically the real like child at heart that does exist within her. It is right. that, that quirky front side that we see with her friends. Like right. it's in, 
as near as I could tell as the movie progresses, my again, this is me attempting to interpret it, but it was the case that the parents of Mei Lin and her parents before her and so on and so forth, going back into history, there has always been this kind of pressure to conceal that. Take that panda spirit and contain it. Right. You know, like to, like it has it it was a gift, now it is an inconvenience. Yes. Yeah. And and now you need to figure out where to put it. And the Right. The, like it, it represented a lack of control of right. oneself rather right. than an expression of oneself. Right. Right. Yes, exactly. And it seems like a lot of what, what this film is is delving into is sort of that idea of like how to embrace expression of oneself, but also maybe have some kind of control over that. Right. Like, the things that make you emotional are probably also the things that make you you on some level. Right. Um, and so that was the big question to me is like, what what is the panda supposed to represent? Right. And I think you're right. I think it's definitely because like right at the beginning of the movie, you see her hanging out with her friends and they're all, you know, having a good time. And she's, you know, keeps telling you the canvas. She keeps breaking the fourth wall. In the oh, movie, yeah. Which is yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, how in control of her life she is. And she's her own woman and all that stuff. And then clearly she's just like under her mother's thumb as well. Sure. And like her friends are just like, they're like obviously a very tight knit group. But clearly her friends are like, mm, we don't get to see you that much. And then as soon as the panda comes out, it's like they're all hanging out all the time. Like this is her like truest self. Like this is when... She's like actually hanging out with them and they're having fun and they're like, well, maybe you should keep the panda because we didn't ever see you before. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like, yeah, to them, the panda is a good thing. Right. And the question is sort of like, what is that, the polarity involved? Like, what is the perspective from a parent's end of things and what, and the way they view the panda versus your friend's? and how they view the panda. Right. Because, I mean, they're two wildly different perspectives in terms of what the people in your life at that age want from you. Right. Like, your your peers want to go and have fun and be goofy and laugh and have right. a good time. And your parents want to prepare you for some kind of future. Right. It's like, it's this big question of, like, the mom having those, like, very... It, specific expectations for Mei Lin uh, to grow up and be like a very specific kind of way that like would would surely be a successful person, but like not being very like tunnel vision about it as if this is the only route to success. Right. And it's like a question of like, where do you draw the line between like raising someone who's like responsible and who's like, you know, wants to, you know, uh, make lots of achievements out in the world, but is also like finding their own path. And it's like, I think what the mom has to like learn is like just to embrace and encourage her daughter in whatever direction she's going in, even if it's not the exact direction and path she wanted her to go down. Right. Yeah. And yeah, like, yeah. And I think it's kind of fascinating because like very recently becoming a parent myself, one of the the big things that I feel like I'm, I'm constantly thinking about in the background, just as I like imagine forward into Addison's life is sort of this like, you don't want your kids to be sheltered, but you also don't want negative things to happen to them. <laughs> right. And so it's like, it, I mean, it's odd because it's like, like on the, on the one hand, like negative and bad things like can involve trauma and lasting effects and, you know, right. like psychological. Like life will happen to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then also if they've been kept under that umbrella for so long, it's like they're not prepared for the inevitable challenges of right. life when they when they leave the nest. And so yeah, I think again like from me watching this more from a parent's perspective than I was watching it from um May Lin's perspective, I think it was it was interesting to even in my head try to imagine what I would what I what I would hope to find in that balance. Right. Um which I thought was something interesting about the movie. Uh if I wanted to like you know, try to insert myself into it is that I was surprised as someone who was 13 in 2002, I didn't relate very well sure. with, with the character. Um, and it was, it was one thing that I was very curious about what the general public, how they might react right. to this story. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's niche in like a, like a lot of ways. 
Um, for one, you've got like a child, a product of the 90s, yeah. which, you know, I was. Uh, but there's also a lot of like uh, anime influence <laughs> on the movie. There was a ton and I was so there for it. You like, were? Okay. I so, loved it. Okay. Yes. I thought it was like, I thought it was fantastic. All the little things, like the little facial expressions and like the way they just like let themselves like cartoon out all over everything. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I thought it was hilarious. I, I loved it. I loved the eyes yes, in particular. The yeah, eyes like I the thought were- the sparkle eyes yes, everywhere. That was yeah. so good. Although she makes like a certain face when she's drawing the sketch under her bed. Her mask is like- Whoa. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, this is one of the best pause screens in all of Pixar right now. Oh my gosh. Okay, Fantastic. yeah. So and like, to what extent have you either consumed or appreciate anime? I think was another one. Um, growing up in Canada is, yeah. you know, something Specifically that, Toronto, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we, we were discussing it with our trainer who lived in Canada for a very long period of time this morning. And his comment on it was like, I wonder if other people understood all the Canada references. And I was like, Mm. No, can't, can't say that I did. <laughs> that one cleared my head. Yeah. Hello and welcome everybody to the scenic route where around here we're known for our abrupt interruptions. But really, this movie is just, it's so much fun to talk about that it's really made me want to go to Toronto. So I think I'm gonna. And it's actually even thematically appropriate that I'm here because today's sponsor is Babbel and I am still working on my French. Thanks to Babbel, there is a great new way to learn a new language that doesn't feel like homework. So whether you're traveling abroad, like me, or want to connect with a family member who maybe speaks a different language or just speak in their native language for once, or maybe you just have some free time and wanna learn something new. Either which way, Babbel's bites size lessons make it really easy to learn and have something that is practical to use in the real world. Also, you know what, now that I think about it, Toronto is not even like a super French Canadian city. It's Montreal. I should have gone to Montreal, but that wouldn't fit with the movie. Anyway, while I'm here, I may as well hide. Honey, where did I? I leave it though. Seriously though, there are so many different ways that you can be learning thanks to Babbel. In addition to their lessons, they have videos, games, podcasts, even live classes. Plus they have a 20 day money back guarantee. So that is always handy. I don't know why I snapped, that was weird. You can also choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, Italian, German, and French. Be sure to start your language learning journey with Babbel today, because right now when you buy the three month subscription, you'll get an extra three months absolutely free. That is six months of Babbel for the price of three months. Just simply head on over to babbel.com and use promo code J versus B at checkout. That's going to be Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L.com and promo code J versus B at checkout. Link is in the description down below. <sighs> well, looks like Ben took his luggage with him again, which I guess means I have some time on my hands. But hey, since we've been talking so much about turning red, maybe I'll just watch something else real quick. It's like a palate cleanser, which reminds me of today's other sponsor, ExpressVPN. Because honestly, if you're using Netflix or other streaming services without having ExpressVPN, it's like getting a membership to your local gym and then only having access to the treadmills. Ugh. In case you didn't know, ExpressVPN lets you change your online location, meaning you can control where Netflix thinks you're located, which is cool because different places have different access to different shows. And so in the spirit of turning red, I think I'm gonna check out what's on Canadian Netflix right now. Oh, Inception. Yeah, I think Ben's gonna be gone for at least 148 minutes. Does it fall? Does it fall? The great thing about ExpressVPN too, compared to other VPNs is that it's super fast. Like you can watch stuff from all over the place with zero buffering. Plus it's compatible with all of your devices, phones, laptops, tablets, smart TVs, and more, which means you like me can enjoy Inception exactly the way it was intended on your phone. So stay out of limbo or in other words, unconstructed dream space and start getting the maximum value out of all of your different streaming services. And viewers of our channel can get three months of ExpressVPN for free when they head over to expressvpn.com slash jverseb. One more time, that's expressvpn.com slash jverseb. Link is in the description down below. Uh, Do you know, um, I, the whole movie, I don't know if you guys watch on YouTube, Amanda Rachley, but she is a Asian Canadian girl who grew up in the 90s 
Uh, or maybe she's younger than us. But her whole vibe on YouTube is very 90s and she's like an artist. So I was like, I kept thinking about her the whole movie. So she's like the like, cross section she's like, of everything she's like I'm saying. Things. I was like, this movie was made for you, Amanda. I, I, like, I want to talk to her about it. Like, I know, we should bring her on. Yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. But yeah, so then in addition to that, it's a young girl going through adolescence, um, Chinese heritage, and then also this idea of like the ancestral and parental expectations. Yeah, that like, the, but Disney is just like hitting the generational trauma button hard lately yes like i mean obviously in kanto which just came out but even before that like coco pretty much kind of hitting the same button too also true like they are they are i don't know what happened <laughs> <laughs> but some people have got some things they're getting off their chest maybe this is like maybe if you grew up as an artist maybe this was a much thing like <laughs> i don't know right yeah. well one of the questions i thought about because i had the same observation is almost like is this one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now because i don't tend to think of this particular problem as something <clears throat> as like the big issue of our generation but i almost wonder if we're too close to it maybe and it's, like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like when we zoom back or like 30 years from now we're gonna be like uh, that's, a, that's we were all all of us that's what we, we were, were dealing all, with. We were all okay. So, but like, okay, let's circle back. You said yeah. you weren't sure what you would do. Like, do you think in 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 Maylin's situation, like, would you have let her go to the concert? I would have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think that I would have had that level of like. There's no doubt in my mind that I am uh, very into the idea of giving her as many opportunities to go and like live um, it up. Well, I don't even know if "live it up" is the right word, but like. Sure like encounter problems on her own. Sure. Um, and ultimately like I can know that at the end of the day, I'm probably like one, I either went through a lot of the same things myself uh, or two, I don't know that there's an immediate criticism that I think I would have as a parent because I also know that how formative a lot of those experiences were sure. for me as an individual and how they ultimately like shaped a lot of who I yeah. became as an adult. So, okay, let's go one layer deeper. Okay. Would you let her go with just her friends and no adults? Yeah. To a general admission, no seats, open crowd. I think if it was, I think it helps that it was a concert that I think the typical demographic would fall into the same category. Yeah. Uh, if it was like a heavy metal band, yeah. I think that there'd <laughs> be, true. like I have seen mosh pits before and that is something like where I think there's there could be some level of restraint or maybe put them in a seated area instead yeah. of like in the in the right the, the turf yeah i think i think the way i see it is like if you want to if you want your kids to make right the right decisions you have to give them the opportunities to make those decisions yes yeah and like that's i think a lot of what malin's mom is not letting her doing at all right She's just like no i will make the right decisions and tell you what they are and you just trust me no matter what and to like a comical extent being yeah like, you know, showing off oh like God. at school <laughs> and <laughs> me her mom absolutely wins the award for most embarrassing parent. Oh, uh, yes. All. Like, like a lot, like, so in Inside Out, you see Riley's like embarrassing moment on her first day of school and it's like heartbreaking. And like where she like starts crying in front of the class. That, and that, that I, scene I gets me that moment. every single time. But oh my gosh, they do it to Maylin like two or three times throughout the movie. And it's just like, oh no, oh no, no. It's like, please don't do it. Please don't do that. Yeah, like she is getting so, and it's like, at least Riley's is self inflicted. You know, this is. <laughs> this is yeah. just like the mom, just like having blinders just on. Having OG shows up with a pad. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was so terrible. Oh, I mean, I, I have to Please. say, though, I have to say on that note, there is something that I have a massive amount of appreciation for this topic on, not to get overly birds and the bees on everybody here mm -hmm. on SCB. Um, <clears throat> but it's like the, the thing that I did think that I related to is that going through adolescence, there is a lot of stuff happening and it's not the most talked about topic in the world. Yeah. Like one of the sponsors, of this channel once upon a time is a company called Manscaped. Yep. And it is a company that, uh, this is not sponsored to be talking right now, just using it as an example. But they bring a huge amount of humor to the conversation. And I think that makes it a lot more approachable. Right. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like, haha, I'm laughing, but also I might be learning a little bit, <laughs> you know, like, and that's good. Um, and so, when I saw this movie, when I even saw the title of the movie, I was like, I could see there being people out there that are like, this is like, this isn't even on the nose. This is the nose. Right. You know, like, um, but I think I really think that that is something that is going to be helpful to so many people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the, the biggest accolades that I would give this movie is, att is attempting to be involved in that. 
Yeah, that I th it was pretty interesting because they attacked they attacked that exact um, sentiment pretty head on, like, um, like the the morning she wakes up as the panda, right? And the mom like asks her specifically, like, did the red peony bloom? And then she's like, no, you know, like <laughs> it's hilarious. But she's like, no. And then she's like, maybe. <laughs> It is just like it's like I feel like that was the movie telling you like this is not exactly what this is about. That's but true. But if you want to take it that way, great. That's fine. You can do that. It, it, you're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's it's like they they spent time with it. Yeah. They addressed They're it, like, and then the yeah. rest of the movie is is almost more about this idea because uh, th that that is what I thought the panda was going to represent. And right. Ultimately, what the panda did represent, it felt like was more this um, like embrace, feel your emotions. And just because you are feeling them and letting them out doesn't mean that you aren't in control of them. Right. Uh, because the idea of suppressing feelings could be a lot more damaging than feeling feelings. Right. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, so I. That, yeah. That's a good point. So great messaging. Yes. I, I think across the board. I think it'll be a, a very very highly productive film in that way. Did you think so? It also sort of like push some boundaries, like just in like the kinds of like language it used. Like, I think it's the first Pixar movie to ever use like the word sexy. Oh, you know, sure. At one point I was like, oh, that caught me a little off guard. And it's like, yeah, it, but it came to pass. I was like, okay, whatever. Did it, I don't feel like it was like particularly harmful. No, or anything. no, no, yeah. yeah, not at all. Um, um, but that is true. And we've seen a little bit of stuff like that where Incredibles, or not, I'm just going to use the Incredibles as an example, where Pixar has pushed these boundaries like in The Incredibles 2, where the um, they're like openly drinking like alcoholic beverages, mm -hmm. for example. It's kind of like one of those things where it's like, typically in these kids' movies, you don't expect to see that. Like I think even in Toy Story, when you go into Sid's house and there are like cans littered across <coughs> the floor, it's very clear the parent that Sid lives with. Right. Like, like we know what it's trying to tell us, but I think they're soda cans. Are they? Yeah, they might be. It might be like like root beer or something. Yeah. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, I have to go back and check. But so anyway, but, I mean, yes, I think that as time goes on, like Pixar has done with animation in so many different ways where they have pushed the boundaries, it does seem like they are also now pushing the boundaries out on like the topics, the yeah. themes, the language. Right. Um, yeah, I think so. So on that, on that exact note then, did you, let me get your take on this because I feel like they were also pushing just sort of like lightly, but um, do you think, I think, I'm pretty sure the character of Priya, like one of her friends was um, like intended to be like bisexual in the movie. I guess I don't know if I got that. All right, well, let me let me walk you through it then. Okay. Okay, so obviously at the beginning, they're all like fawning over the guy in the bucket hat and they're all fawning over the boy band the entire time. Right. So like there's that, but then also at like, Tyler's party or whatever, like she has a moment with the goth girl and then like oh, Maylin yeah. scoops her over to her and they're sort of like dancing together and all of her friends are like staring like, yay, you know, like in a way that's not like, look, she's dancing with another person. Oh, sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's much more. Okay. Like they have like, they have like an actual moment where they sort of see each other and have like this big smile and it's like, oh, that's okay. That was awesome. That I think that it's like, it's just sort of like present, but all of her friends are super accepting of it. And yeah, I thought that was cool. Uh, that is incredibly cool. Yeah. I, I I will say that um, now that you say that, that feels a lot more obvious in my head. But mm -hmm. one of the criticisms I had of the movie was with the friends and my my difficulty um, finding or understanding what their respective personalities were. Mm. Um, like where it seemed like so much, and this honestly, it wouldn't even surprise me if like when Addison has a group of friends like this of her own, like if I'm driving them in a car somewhere just trying to be like, who's what? Like, you know, yeah. like I could imagine like it just being such like structured chaos that <laughs> it is hard to keep up with the narrative, um, which I think has probably been true for parents of teenagers since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. um, that being said though, yeah, like their personalities were also like snappy and quick that it was kind of like, and you're, which, so I don't know. I, I've only watched it one time, which is yeah. probably part of it where I, I haven't had enough time with the characters to really get to know each of the three friends extremely well. Like, right. like having a better idea of It seemed like they, they gave are. like like um, Abby the very like, I'm angry and crazy all the time 
kind of like she's the one who punches her. And then they have Priya, who's just sort of like a mellow tone at all the times. Except that she also was like very obviously super excited about like all the four town stuff. Yes. Which was kind of fun. And then the other girl whose name I cannot remember, Miriam. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. 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 She was like, the, I feel like she was kind of like the, the, the leader, like the best friend. The best friend for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, let me just say, what I, this... <laughs> This is this is a thing that I felt like when I saw it on screen, I was like, why are you doing that? But when she's chewing the gum in her braces, I was like, it made me cringe so hard. I was like, why? Oh, no. Oh, no. I can't. Ah, oh, you're never getting that out. Guts, oh. guts the rebel, What are you Jay? doing? Stop chewing. Why would you? Yeah. Anyway, minor complaint over. Minor vent. Minor vent. There you go. Um, yeah. So, okay. The the next thing as we, as we kind of like trudge forward here is we learn a lot about this um like you know the the gift that was given to this family which is yeah. which is like basically going through this process of becoming a red panda which uh in the early days was like to protect the family right um which i thought was you know like a very interesting origin story for it and it, it seemed like this thing that like for a very long period of time it was it was probably very advantageous for the family to have this protective element involved right and then of course you know, fast forward into modern times and there's just not as much of a need, you know, for one of the members of the family to be this like, like protector in such a physical sense. Right. So obviously each of the members of the family have, have now started going through these rituals of containing theirs, which is not to say that they were gone. They're just contained. Right. What I ultimately thought was very interesting about where the story went is at the end you have uh, this, like the, everything's playing out. They've all become their red pandas and they all sort of go into the, um, reminded me a lot of the movie Black Panther when they kind of go in and could like meet their ancestors yeah. and stuff, like as they're becoming oh, right, the Black yeah. Panther yeah. itself. But they kind of go into this forest and while they're all in there, you watch as each of the aunts, the grandmother and the mother basically like continue with their decision to abandon their pandas. Right. Like they make the choice to to step away. And um, what uh, Mei Lin ultimately decides to do is to keep hers. This was something where I was kind of like, I was maybe surprised that the plot of the movie wasn't going to be enough to convince the parents to also embrace their pandas. Right. It was. I was a little surprised that I all just immediately went right back. Yeah. Yeah. Because to me, that was an interesting, like, I, I think I struggled just a little bit trying to understand maybe what it was trying to say with that tidbit. Like, is it still the case that, like, Maylin is still going through this formative time of her life? And that being said, like, yeah, of course she should have her panda. Like, uh, like of course that should be a part of who she is. Like, it's, it's a part of, you know, growing as a person and being, like, emotionally, like, in a safe and happy and healthy place. Yeah. But, like... Is that also to say that, like, at some point in time, she should also then do the ritual again? I don't think so. No. I think the other, I think the, uh, well, for one, the mom, I think it just makes good sense for her to just try and keep it in. Because if she was, like, bursting into giant panda at a, on a whim's notice, that just seems real destructive for the whole city. I did love how they had the little thermometer at the end for repairs to like the mega dome. Yeah. I remember <laughs> and it was like, you know, like we're like down here at the bottom and it goes all the way up to like, you know, like $20 million or yeah. something like that. It's like, oh gosh. That was pretty funny. Um, I think, and then I think my interpretation of the aunts and the grandma is just like, they're just, they're very just set in their ways at this point. Like they've decided who they are a long time ago and they knew it needed to be done in the moment. But for the most part, this is like, yeah, they've already decided who they were. But I think that also just sort of reinforces like they all talk about like how impressed they are that like Mei Lin's able to actually control the panda. Like it's not, I think for them, it must've been exploding out in a much more like violent way all the time and unpredictable. Like they couldn't control it at all. Right. Kind of situation. And we learned that the way Mei Lin is actually controlling it is by thinking about her friends and like that calms her down. And we always, whenever she's hanging out with them, that's when she seems to be like the most herself. Right. And stuff. So I think that is just another layer of like, Mei Lin is able to control it because she's able to like actually express who she is. Whereas the other um, women in the family were not because they were just like falling in line with whatever their mother said all the time. And were like, not like, we're just like that. That's the way it is. And so that's how it is. And you know. Like, do you think it's possible that that's even like a demonstration of like um, 
not to get too in the weeds with it, but like maybe some layer of societal growth, like that maybe it is more acceptable in today's time to embrace exactly who you are as mm. an individual. Sure. Whereas like maybe for them, it's like, this just wasn't the case during our time. Like we we couldn't go and, yeah. you know, to use the, the context of the film, like we couldn't go and be the red panda, but like the world as it is now is like, much more accepting yeah. of, of that idea. Maybe. Well, I just, I also don't think they're like unhappy with their decisions. Sure. You know? Like it kept, I mean, if Malin had decided she wanted to give it up, like that would have been okay too. Of course. You know, of course. Yeah. Um, so I mean, uh, that's, that is um, maybe what I, what I ultimately, when I got to the end of the movie, I think what I was having the most, the most difficulty with is, is probably answering or like reconciling that question in my head. It was kind of like, so is the red panda something we all have in a way? And like, if, like, I think I was trying to even think like, what would mine be? Like, what have I, what are characteristics of myself? Yeah, like, what did you, what did you suppress anything of yourself in adolescence? Right, right, right. yeah. And like, what would that have been? And, and if I had been just like, felt comfortable enough to fully embrace those things, what would it have looked like? Mm -hmm. um, and that, it, honestly, more than anything, it could just speak to my own personal experiences sure. in life, which is to say that they, that maybe I didn't find myself in a position where I needed to do that, or maybe I did and it was so long ago that I can't yeah. even like. Well, even just that it's making you like go back and think about those things and consider those like moments in your life, I think is sort of maybe the point of the movie. Like if it helps you get somewhere today, then that's great. That's also very true. Yeah. That's very true. <clears throat> Yeah, so so I guess like for you though, like did you, cause I know that you've talked about this before and a huge function of this very channel yes. is this idea of celebrating yourself, celebrating these fandoms that we all love and um, making it acceptable to, to love these things as openly as you want to. Right. Um, <clears throat> which I know that is something in some capacity you and I had discussed like coming up through high school where maybe we weren't super quick to broadcast how much we loved Harry Potter or something right, like yeah. that. Um, or just felt like a lot of like social pressure to like, oh yeah, that's not cool. Or like, oh yeah, I'll have to just sort of like this in secret or right. things like that. Right, and, yeah. and I know that you in particular, I, like, I think had like maybe felt this even more than I did, at least based on conversations that we've had mm -hmm. about this like era of life. Like, did you have some relationship with that where you were like, man, the way that I, you know, loved Pokemon cards in high school or something could have been like, a panda characteristic for me. Did any of that like? I guess I didn't, I didn't, you know, the more we're talking about it right now, I think um, I can see like a lot of those things for sure. Yeah. I think the, I think what one of the great things or that I've been fortunate in personally is that like, since I've become an adult, I think I have like reflected on a lot of those things a lot and have just been like able to embrace a lot of those things Sure. now. So I think I've, I have personally resolved a okay. lot of those things, which is good. But I would even say like, just like doing YouTube and not to get like too personal, but like just doing this at all was like a big jump of like releasing like, you know, my inner panda, if you will. No, and yeah, yeah. and you and I, we have talked about this before, but I absolutely think that that's true. Like I know, and me and you have discussed before, but like you had, uh, I think your senior year of high school in English class, and then yeah. in college you had an intro to acting course. And both of those, classes, I think to the rest of the family almost saw a side of you come out mm -hmm. that we were all like, where is this coming from? Yeah, I remember talking to mom about that one day. She's like, I just, it, it, nothing could have shocked me more than like when you uploaded these videos to YouTube. And I was just like, it was very weird because it was just like, like, that's surprising for me to hear as your son because like this is who I felt I've always been. Right. Kind of thing. And it's like, it's weird that you, my mom don't know that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe what's your inner panda? <laughs> what's your, I mean, that is probably that's the that, question. That is the question yeah. of the day, and and I think that um, everything else aside about about the movie, if you've made it to if you made it this far in this review, uh, then I think it's amazing because chances are it means that you will have now taken a few minutes, seconds of your day to consider this very thought, or maybe go and have a conversation with someone in your life about something that you feel like could have been your inner panda. Yeah, and maybe maybe. You'd even be willing to let some of that out. Yeah. I think you should. You should. Definitely let it out. Do it. Roar. Roar. Anyway. <laughs> oh, man. So what is your, what's your, do you have like an overall score you want to give on just like personal enjoyment? Okay. Yes. And okay. so here, so I hope, and I want, I want, as we're coming in to record this review, 
one of the most important things to me was that I wanted to convey all of the positive that I think that this movie uh, has and does and like I agree with. Um, that being said, for me as a Pixar movie, I would say throughout the entire viewing process, I was living somewhere just under like at like an underwhelmed level. Okay. Um, like I I wasn't finding myself and and this is like this is not thematic at all. It was literally just like my own like we we call it the movie theater experience, but my my living room experience. Right. In this particular case, I wasn't like on the edge of my seat. I wasn't fully absorbed by the movie. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I would say that I didn't, in, in the most generic terms, I didn't find it like wildly entertaining. Um, and I also saw a lot of people discuss how funny they thought it was. And I I, I did not laugh. Oh, really? Watching okay. the movie. I yeah. think I laughed out loud like a lot, even and, with like the first 10 minutes. Yeah, and this yeah. this to me is is definitely one of those where it's like, I'm happy to admit that I'm probably just wrong or that it's there's- not, It's not wrong, it's just your personal enjoyment of it. That, yes, yes. yeah. But no, I don't want to project that I think that others should feel the way that I, I felt about it uh, is, is mostly what I'm saying. Cause I, I do think that it's, I do think it's great. I just think that at the end of the day, I sort of was like, okay. And, and unlike Encanto, which I finished and then promptly watched again like six times, um, <laughs> I like even had, I watched it on Friday night, I had all day with my daughter on uh, Saturday while Alice was at work. And <clears throat> after watching Encanto, I watched it again with Addy, like during feedings and stuff like that. And this so was- So since you've watched Turning Red, you've watched Encanto twice. No, 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 okay. uh, when, when, <laughs> okay. when I got into Encanto, uh, that was my relationship with it. It was, it okay. was this very like, I kept coming back to it. I wanted to watch it again. I wanted to listen to the music. Uh, I, I did to, like the music in this movie. The Four Town songs were it is, so funny. It is very funny. Billie yeah. Eilish and, um, oh gosh, I always forget her brother's name. It's up there. It's, Riley put it on screen for me. But they are the ones who, who made the music for it. Yeah. And I think very fittingly, they are like massive uh, you know, pop stars at this point in time. I think they have a very good uh, sense for the tone and voice that they delivered with this. Um, that being said, my total score, I would probably give it like a 78 out of 100. Okay, I was leaning around like 87 out okay. of 100. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not like my new favorite Pixar movie, but I did find it really entertaining and I enjoyed it okay. a lot. And I mean, I do have like three kids and Luke requested to watch it again. So it's been on, I've probably seen like, I've seen it like probably most, almost three times ish, you there know, you here and there yeah. already. <laughs> okay, guys, well, that is what we thought of the movie. But of course, we want to know what you think of the movie. And one way that we're getting an answer to that is through our patrons. Yes, we went over to our quiz masters over here on Patreon and asked them to send us their real quick 15 second review of Turning Red. We have gone through them, and here are some of our favorites. My favorite things about Turning Red are just how accurately it depicts the just painfully cringe reality of being a 13 year old. The absolutely just mind-blowing cinematography. This movie is weird, adorable, and altogether wonderful. 9 out of 10. I love it. Hey brothers, I'm Michaela from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and what I liked about Turning Red was they told a story through a different cultural perspective, as well as their unique animation choices throughout the movie. I would give it a 6 out of 10. Not my favorite, but it's Pixar, so I obviously recommend it. Hey guys, Bob Barna from Atlanta. Turning Red is a gorgeous film about learning to love and embrace your true self, and about finding the strength to stand up for yourself, even in the face of a family that wants you to hide who you really are. It's a brilliant message that's relevant to so many people, and I highly recommend it. Nine out of 10. Thank you so much, Quizmasters. If you would like to see your own review possibly featured in a Super Carlin Brothers video, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Super Carlin Brothers and select the Quizmasters tier. Special thank you to all these other Quizmasters who've supported us throughout the years as well, like you and you. And you, man, a special thank you to you. Wow. wow. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. oh, boy. These are some of the best, the best quiz masters the world ever did serve up. We appreciate you guys so very much. There you go, guys. Uh, be sure to let us know what your thoughts were. What is your inner panda? And yes. what score would you give it? Let us know in the towel section down below. Also, stay tuned for later this week when we talk about how Turning Red fits into the Pixar theory. What? Yeah. 
it's gonna be. It's actually awesome. It's pretty cool. It's awesome. Yeah. Be excited. Um, otherwise, until next time. Bye. Bye.